History lovers of Reddit, who's the coolest person in history no one has ever heard of. Major Digby Tatham Water, whose Wikipedia entry reads like the synopsis of an amazing World War II action comedy, among other noteworthy items. He carried an umbrella everywhere because he had trouble remembering passwords and reasoned that anyone who saw him would assume that only a bloody fool Englishman would carry an umbrella into battle. At one point he disabled an armored car using his umbrella. He was eventually captured but escaped and led 150 escaped POWs back across the lines to freedom. On bicycles. After the war is he credited with inventing the modern safari, where animals are photographed instead of killed. I'm not sure it's the coolest, but I went a surprising amount of time without hearing about Saint Maximilian Kolbe, and I honestly believe he should be a household name. He was a Polish Catholic priest who was arrested and sent to Auschwitz after publishing anti-Nazi publications. When a prisoner in Auschwitz escaped, it was common punishment to kill 10 people in his place, and on this day it was decided that 10 would be murdered in starvation chambers. One person chosen at random cried out for mercy, and Maximilian took his place. As the ten lay in the starvation chamber he led them in prayer and despite two weeks without food or water, stood up and looked at the Nazi guards calmly every time they entered to remove the dead. Running out of patience, the Nazi guards eventually killed him by lethal injection. He's a national hero in Poland, but it is a name I'd really like known world over. An unknown Soviet tank crew that held an entire German division back for a day in the Battle of Rasenai in 1941. From between giants, the battle for the Baltics and World War II. More than a KV-1 or KV-2 tank. Accounts vary. Advanced far behind the German lines after attacking a column of German trucks. The tank stopped on a road across soft ground and was engaged by four 50mm anti-tank guns of the 6th Panzer Division Anti-Tank Battalion. The tank was hit several times but fired back, disabling all four guns. A heavy 88mm gun of the divisional anti-aircraft battalion was moved about 730 meters, 800 did, behind the tank but was knocked out by the tank before a good score a hit. During the night, German combat engineers tried to destroy the tank with satchel charges but failed despite possibly damaging the tracks. Early on the morning of the 25th of June. German tanks fired on the KV from the woodland while an 88mm gun fired at the tank from its rear. Of several shots fired, only two penetrated the tank. German infantry advanced and the KV opening machine gun fire against them and the tank was knocked out by grenades thrown into the hatches. According to some accounts, the crew was buried by the German soldiers with full military honors. In other accounts, the crew escaped during the night. The nameless berserker of Stamford Bridge. He held off an entire English army alone on a small bridge. With just his big Danics, no arrow could bring him down. Only later did someone poke him from underneath the bridge into his balls. He instantly went to Valhalla. Read this sentence. Roman von Ungern Sternberg was an Austrian-born Russian anti-Bolshevik lieutenant general in the Russian Civil War and then an independent warlord whose Asiatic Cavalry Division wrested control of Mongolia from the Republic of China in 1921 after its occupation. When I read his biography I had to keep fact-checking because honestly, this guy's life seems utterly unbelievable. He formed his own Mongol horde in Godam 1921. He was obviously an irredeemable asshole. But what a wild life. Not unknown but seems to be far less commonly known is Sabute. The main general under Genghis Khan and his son Ajedi was a brilliant strategist that could coordinate armies separated by hundreds of miles. He also conquered more territory than any other military commander in history. Julie Dorbiny. Basically think Korea Stark but real. French. And a highly promiscuous bisexual. She was a singer by profession but hired a master swordsman to teach her how to fence and quickly became ridiculously good at it. She and this instructor got into a fight with some French nobleman and she challenged him to a duel. Won it. But then had to flee the gendarmerie because dueling was technically illegal by the 17th century in France. She dressed up in disguise a lot of the time. Including frequently in men's clothing. And as a result was challenged several times to other duels by obnoxious French noblemen who took exception to her dress sense. She killed them all. She then became a farmhouse socialite and caused a scandal by kissing a woman at a ball, again. 
while wearing men's clothing, and was challenged to three separate duels by yet more obnoxious French noblemen who didn't like her snagging some hot chick right in front of them. Despite the fact that she was by this time one of the most famously skilled fencers in Europe, she killed them all too. Obviously, this amused the French king so much that he just pardoned her of all crimes because literally, he was so entertained by her outrageous awesomeness. During this time she had somehow managed to procure a position as a singer at the Paris Opera House, despite being technically under a sentence of death for illegally dueling multiple people until she pardoned for, as mentioned, killing yet more people, and shagged her way around the male and female members of the opera. At one point a visiting conductor was treating the women there badly, so she just rolled up her sleeves and beat the it out of him. The eventual love of her life was a French countess, but this countess died young leaving her inconsolable and she herself then died, possibly by suicide. Having done all of this by the age of 33, if I were Alexander Dumas I'd sit there and think well, I had this idea for a novel, but this is probably just a bit too unbelievable even for me. Mary Elizabeth Bowser. She was a spy in the Confederate White House, working as a servant, and leaked a bunch of stuff to the Union. Jefferson Davis knew there was a spy, but never suspected her because she was black. Edit. Typo. Manaheim is fairly unknown outside of Finland. He was the Tsar's bodyguard and one of the first Europeans to meet Dalai Lama. Escaped Russia during the revolution and came to Finland to lead the whites in Finnish civil war. Later lead the Finnish army in winter war and continuation war. Giving the Red Army a good fight and then became Finland's sixth president. The highest military award you can earn in Finland is named after him as well. Zenobia. Queen of the Palmyrene Empire. She was a warrior and well educated. Fluent in several languages. After her husband was murdered. She became regent of her son. She seized control of territories in the east. Conquered Egypt. And built a powerful empire. Later. She was captured after a Roman siege and executed. She is known as a heroic queen and a freedom fighter who inspired Catherine the Great. Vera Atkins was a spy for the Allies and worked with the man who is said to have inspired the character of James Bond. One of her specialties was improvising weapons on the fly. Her exploits are chronicled in a really excellent book called Spimistress. Tycho Brahe. At least I assume nobody knows who he is because if they did, He'd be one of the most beloved men in history. You ever meet a college frat bro that was inexplicably brilliant despite being, well, a total frat bro? A rare genius who would spend his weekends chugging beer and eating ass, only to go to class on Monday and set the curve for the test he didn't study for? Taicho Brahe is the patron saint of such unicorns. Taicho Brahe was one of the most brilliant astronomers of the early renaissance. His data, far more accurate than that of his contemporaries, set the stage for men like Johannes Kepler and Galileo Galilei to decode the secrets of kinematics. He painted the most accurate representation of the solar system that the world had ever seen, and was the giant upon whom Isaac Newton stood. Comma, but he was also a total ducking party animal. He would throw huge rages and invite royalty and nobility, and bring his pet moose along and get it wasted. That's right. A full grown ducking moose. He lost his nose in a duel and got it replaced with one made of gold just to flex on every hater in the world. He died when his bladder exploded because he was partying too hard and didn't want to leave to use the bathroom. Every time a college student shows up to their midterm hungover and crushes it anyway. The ghost of Taicho Brahe is smiling down on them. Carolus Rex or Charles XII of Sweden single-handedly fought Russia and others leading only a small army of Swedes. Despite being outnumbered he would somehow pull out a win. Also known as a warrior king he would lead his men into battle something not as common in this time period. He was unfortunately killed in battle close to the end of the Great Northern War. Sybil Ludington. At 16 years old, she volunteered to ride over 40 miles by horseback in the middle of the night to warn the revolutionaries that the British were coming. It was originally suggested that her older brother make the trip, but she volunteered, claiming the British forces were a lot less likely to stop a young girl on the road. By the time the British troops arrived, about 400 of them, the town had been evacuated. Thanks to Sybil, she rode farther than Paul Revere, and is often referred to as the female Paul Revere. 
Even though she gets almost no historical credit, according to Wikipedia prior to her famous ride, Sybil saved her father from capture when a royalist named Ichabod Prosser tried, with 50 other royalists, to capture her father. Sybil lit candles around the house and organized her siblings to march in front of the windows in military fashion, creating the impression of many troops guarding the house. The royalist and his men fled. So yeah dart pretty badass for a 16 year old girl in the 1700s. Jack Churchill aka Mad Jack was a British officer that carried nothing but a broadsword, longbow, and bagpipes into World War II. Perhaps not the typical version of cool, but another humanitarian who I hadn't heard about until fairly recently, Chun Sugihara, the vice consul of the Empire of Japan in Lithuania. He helped roughly 5-6,000 Eastern European Jews obtain travel visas to the Japanese Empire, risking his life and that of his family in the process. I can't recall exactly where I read it, but I recall that many of those 6,000 visas were drafted up by hand, and I have a vague reminiscence of there being an article or something that described Sugihara frantically handing these out as the last trains he was able to schedule were leaving. He's the only Japanese person to have been given the righteous among the nation's honor by Israel. Mariano Vallejo. He was the Mexican governor of California but he saw that Mexico was too far away and too preoccupied to administer the territory. One day he gets kidnapped by a bunch of drunk white people calling themselves the Bear Flag Rebellion. They want to take him from the SF Bay Area to a fort near Sacramento which takes a few days. Vallejo's lieutenant catched up with them. Sneaks into camp and tells Vallejo hey boss, me and the boys are going to kill the gringos and take you back to Sonoma. Vallejo says no and intentionally remains their prisoner so he can hand the territory over. It becomes the Republic of California and then quickly joins the US as a state. He prevented a long bloody war and orchestrated the creation of the world's fifth largest economy, but he is forgotten by both sides. To the Mexicans he is at best a failure, at worst a traitor. To the US he's the bad guy and the California story. Qingxi. Probably the most successful pirate of all time. A pirate. Leader who terrorized the China Seas during the Jiaqing Emperor period of the Qing Dynasty in the early 19th century. She commanded over 300 junks, ship, traditional Chinese, sailing ships, manned by 20,000 to 40,000 pirates, 1 colon 71 summon women, and even children. She entered into conflict with the major nations, such as the British Empire, the Portuguese Empire, and the Qing Dynasty, to Wikipedia. She died a free woman on her own bed. What a badass. Here is your new favorite hero, Witold Pilecki. He infiltrated the Auschwitz concentration camp and disguised himself as an inmate in order to produce a report on the mass murder happening. He managed to escape at night, overpowering a guard and cutting a phone line. Unfortunately he was executed on false accusations after the war. Miyamoto Musashi by far. He was a samurai from I believe from feudal Japan. Basically this guy was every weeb fantasy. He never lost a fight and dual wielded a katana and wakizashi. After a while he was so good he thought the swords were too easy and switched to using a bokken, wooden sword, and still never lost. The dude was a badass. Before we start, count the number of times he gets severely wounded, shot, or survives something he really shouldn't. Adrian Carton D. Wyatt, a Belgian-born British commander and gentleman, early he abandoned college in order to enlist in the army, even though he was too young, and went to South Africa fighting in the Second Boer War where he was wounded in the stomach and groin. In 1907 he became a British subject and in 1908 he married a countess. He later fought in the First World War in the Somaliland campaign where he was shot twice in the face losing one eye and part of an ear. Despite this he traveled to the Western Front. He was wounded seven more times in the war, losing his left hand in 1915 and pulling off his fingers when a doctor declined to remove them. He was shot through the skull and the ankle at Somme through the hip at Passchendaele through the leg at Cambrai, and through the ear at Arras. During the interwar period he spent much time in Poland and fighting in the Polish-Soviet War. During World War II he fought in Poland and Norway before being sent to garrison Northern Ireland as he was too old to lead troops in active combat. 
In 1941 he was sent to negotiate with the Yugoslav government but his plane crashed after a refuel at Malta and he was knocked unconscious. After regaining consciousness thanks to the cold water he and the others were captured by Italians who brought him to a prison camp for senior British officers. He made five attempts at escaping and succeeded once. Unfortunately he was a 61 year old man with an empty sleeve, an eye patch half and ear and several other battle scars. Oh and also, he was in the middle of northern Italy with no capability to speak Italian. After 8 days he was recaptured. After being freed he attended the Cairo conference and is seen on the picture from said event together with Winston Churchill, Franklin D. Roosevelt and Chiang Kai-shek. After the war he retired, he married and settled down in Cork, Ireland. Caravaggio. He was a painter active in the late 1500s early 1600s who was either a badass or a psychopath depending how you look at it. He used to carry a sword around in case he'd get in brawls and actually killed a man over an argument stemming from a tennis match, forcing him to exile and flee to Naples. Not only that but he was petty as duck painting a horse's ass to be placed facing a painting his rival was commissioned for. August Arada King, Countess of Lovelace, Nebiron. The 10th of December 1815 saw the 27th of November 1852, was an English mathematician and writer, chiefly known for her work on Charles Babbage's proposed mechanical general purpose computer, the analytical engine. She was the first to recognize that the machine had applications beyond pure calculation, and published the first algorithm intended to be carried out by such a machine. As a result, she is sometimes regarded as the first to recognize the full potential of a computing machine and one of the first computer programmers. Terror. He was a French folk hero, and there is even a town named after him, but nobody really knows him anymore. He was a great eater. By the age of 10 he could eat pretty much a whole goat. He had some hijinks that later involved eating dead bodies, live cats, then a baby. Super morbid story but absolutely hilarious to tell. Sam Onella has a great video on the story. I had a good friend of mine tell me the story initially and Sam's video came up when I googled him. PHNGCCHNH was a Vietnamese warrior who lead troops into battle against the Chinese while pregnant, went into labor on the front lines, gave birth, and kept fighting carry her newborn. Yi Sun Sin was the Korean naval commander. Except he never studied naval combat or strategy. He repeatedly fought back much larger Japanese fleets using superior strategy and just general ferocious badassery. Both of these are well known in their respective cultures. But you rarely hear about them in western history classes. Base Reeves. More than Base Reeves. July 1838 saw the 12th of January. 1910. Was the first black deputy US. Marshal west of the Mississippi River. He worked mostly in Arkansas and the Oklahoma Territory. Uh, during his long career, he was credited with arresting more than 3,000 felons. He shot and killed 14 outlaws in self-defense. Not very obscure, but Yi Sun Shin was the Korean admiral that, with a combination of factors, completely and almost single-handedly halted the Japanese invasion of Korea and destroyed a significant portion of the Japanese navy with only a handful of ships. Hedy Lamar. She's starting to finally get recognition but she's not as famous as she should be. Married to a wealthy Nazi sympathizing arms dealer. She fled Austria and became a film actress in America. She wanted to help out with the war efforts. So she researched extensively and created technology that led to today's Wi-Fi. Her findings were dismissed at the time. Sadly because people just saw her as another famous and beautiful face. Vasil Levski. Bulgarian revolutionary during the final decades of the Ottoman Empire, used disguises to evade capture for years and created an elaborate autonomous government that angered Ottoman and Bulgarian overlords alike, including a male service and constitution. Until him, most anti-Ottoman antagonists used guerrilla warfare, but he saw the need to develop a stable government to take over after Ottoman rule. When he was captured he absolutely refused to name any of his co-conspirators and suffered greatly for it before he was finally hung outside of Sofia. He had the kind of foresight rare in anti-government antagonists. You've all heard of Harriet Tubman but she was a lot more badass than the history books in school teach you. She was literally a special ops commando that incited and successfully led slave rebellions and blew up confederate naval ships. 
She was an excellent spy, armed scout, nurse, and even a politician. She freed 700 slaves in a single day, before she was even nicknamed Moses for her work in the Underground Railroad. And she even recovered from a massive head injury as a child, kicked in the head by a horse. So a black, former slave, woman who also recovered from a traumatic brain injury had more glorious feats than some of our most famed fictional action heroes. She was a true American hero. Not a single slave owner could ever hold a candle to her. Edit. Yes this means she was a better, more impressive person than probably any of the founding fathers. By far. A Soviet woman. Maria Oktyabrskaya. In 1941 the Nazis killed her husband. So she sold everything they owned. Petitioned Stalin to allow her to buy a frickin tank and join the front line. She named it Fighting Girlfriend and in her first action killed about 30 Nazis and took out an anti-tank gun by herself. Exequius. 5th century BC. We're fairly sure of that. Athenian pottery artist essentially was the first person to produce incised depictions of human characters with any level of details because his techniques allowed for smaller more intricate details. This technique was then adopted by the majority of potters and was still in at the time of the fall of Byzantium nearly 20 centuries later. Olga of Kiev. Murdered an entire nation of Drevlians in righteous vengeance for slaying her husband over a tax dispute by using doves. Still got to be a saint. Bertha Benz. When Karl Benz created his motor origin. In 1886. No one really cared about it, until his wife took the car herself and with their two sons, went on a 66 miles trip to visit her mother, thus becoming the first woman who drove a car, and the first person who drove a car for more than 100 kilometers. Not only she had to solve several mechanical problems along the way, he and her sons also had to push the car occasionally when it got stuck in the muddy road and on steep inclines, make their fuel, no gas stations, and feed this fuel manually into the working engine. No fuel tank. To make the fuel, they stopped at a pharmacy in Wies Lodge to buy the necessary solvents, thus making this pharmacy the world's first gas station. Full stop. Lucrezia Tornabione. She married into the Medici banking family and basically ran the whole show. She ran operated the family business and politics. Later, she was also the chief advisor to her son Lorenzo the Magnificent. And in my humble opinion, the most competent family member. She also sponsored Renaissance art and wrote poetry and plays. Tommy Fitzpatrick. In 1956 he stole a small plane from New Jersey for a bet and then landed it perfectly on the narrow street in front of the bar he had been drinking at in Manhattan. Two years later, he did it again after someone didn't believe he had done it the first time. Here is an article about it. Sir Isaac Brock. Better known as the hero of Upper Canada. Dude didn't give a flying duck about superiors and instead of defending against the Americans during the 1812 war he went out and attacked. He took Canadian militia and dressed them in British regular red coats, who the American soldiers were very afraid of facing, and got aid from the native soldiers fighting on their side who ran around at the fort's defenses and in the tree line to scare the living it out of the American defenders who were even more scared of the savages than they were the English. He had the militia also march in the distance and did it in such a way, while they were still dressed as redcoats, to seem like an invasion army was coming to attack instead of a small army of militia. In the end nobody was killed and the Americans surrendered after a short time, I think three days. The rest of the dude's life is filled with balsy military moves and feats. Considering I read about Diogenes for the first time ever in an Ask Reddit post recently, I'd say he's pretty cool for someone I never heard of. Pretty much anyone from the Sabaton album Heroes. Also Carl Gangel, Wehrmacht commander, surrendered his men to the Azat Castle and wound up fighting alongside them when the SS came to kill prisoners. Prince, Michael of Romania, 1921-2017. He became king of Romania at the age of 6 following the death of his grandfather. His father Carol has previously renounced the throne. The regency didn't work out so well. So Carol reclaimed the throne when Michael was 8. Carol was deposed by the Nazis in 1940 when Michael was 18. Michael took the throne. But the government was run by a Nazi puppet. 
whom Michael overthrew in 1944 when the country switched sides. After the war, the monarchy was abolished by the communists, so he became an ordinary citizen. But unlike just about every other deposed monarch, he was loved by his people. Fun fact, he was a field marshal of the Romanian army. When he died in 2017, he was by several decades the last surviving flag officer of World War II. The nearest competitors died in the early 90s. Akhenaten. So get this. Ancient Egypt is known for its many gods and goddess. Ra. Isis. Orisis. Setekt. So this pharaoh walks in and single-handedly attempts to turn the whole religion upside down and convert everyone to only worship the sun god. Aten. He basically shut down all the other temples in Egypt and built a city named after himself. He is trying to take power back from the priesthood and consolidate it all under the pharaoh. While you've never heard of him, you've probably heard of his much more well-known wife Nefertiti and son Tutankhamun. Tokugori Asu. This man was allergic to death and had a talent for surviving where no one else would have. After a battle between his army and that of Takeda Shinjans, another cool dude to look into, Tokugor made it back to his castle with five soldiers. Five. So you know what he does to repel the massive army of thousands of soldiers? They light every single torch on the wall and while pounding a massive drum, they throw open the gates of the fortress. This is such a ballsy move that Takeda thinks it's a trap and leaves. Feudal Japan was crazy. Private Wartek. After being sold to a Polish military corps as a baby, he worked his way up to private. During World War II his great feats include catching and interrogating spies who infiltrated the company. He beat a 400 pound bear with his bare hands and he moved so much ammunition that the company changed their logo to Wojtek holding a bombshell. He both terrified and was beloved by his commanding officers. His diet consisted of mainly meat, marmalade and he would eat lit cigarettes whole. Oh. Did I forget to mention that he was also a bear? Seriously. Google him. He is the cuddliest soldier you will ever see. I don't know her name, but there was a woman in Iroquois legend who was manly hearted, Iroquois term, not mine, and became the best hunter in her band, taking four wives and controlling a great deal of wealth. I don't know if she's the coolest but she sure did live the dream. Malfdi Zachariah. He's the man who wrote the Algerian national anthem while being held in French prison. He wrote it with his own blood. Literally, he wrote IT with his own freaking blood. William W. Boynton. Boynton was the architect that completed the Chicago Water Tower, one of five structures surviving the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. The Chicago Water Tower, completed in 1869, is 154 feet high and made from yellowing Joliet limestone. The tower was designated the first American water landmark in 1969 and was designated a Chicago landmark in 1971. Chicago Avenue Water Tower and Pumping Station was listed on the National Register of Historic Places as Old Chicago Water Tower District in 1975. Love the answers to this. Tie everyone. This is the first time a post on Ask Reddit that I made got some interesting activity. D. There are plenty of them. One of my favorite doesn't actually involve a person but a bear. Wojtek was a Syrian brown bear bought as a pet. His owner was part of a Polish artillery section and they eventually trained the bear to help a haul ammunition from the depot to the guns. It's a cool story. Bear. Street. Francis of Assisi is well known. But people may not know that during the height of the Crusades, he crossed the Muslim lines to talk to the Sultan of Egypt in an effort to convert him. Boudicca. More than in AD 60 or 61, when the Roman governor Gaius Suetonius Paulinus was campaigning on the island of Anglesey off the northwest coast of Wales, Boudicca led the Isni, the Trinovants, and others in revolt. 6. They destroyed Camulodunum, modern Colchester, earlier the capital of the Trinovants but at that time a colonia, a settlement for discharged Roman soldiers and site of a temple to the former Emperor Claudius. Upon hearing of the revolt, Suetonius hurried to Londonium, modern London, the 20-year-old commercial settlement that was the rebels' next target. He lacked sufficient numbers to defend the settlement, and he evacuated and abandoned Londonium. Boudicca led a very large army of Isni, Trinovants, 
and others to defeat a detachment of Legio IX Hispana, and they burned and destroyed Londinium and Verulamium. More than an estimated 70,000 saw 80,000 Romans and British were then killed in the three cities by those led by Boudicca. 7. Many by torture. 7. Suetonius. Meanwhile, regrouped his forces, possibly in the West Midlands, despite being heavily outnumbered. He decisively defeated the Britons. The crisis caused Nero to consider withdrawing all Roman forces from Britain, but Suetonius' victory over Boudicca confirmed Roman control of the province. More than Boudicca then either killed herself to avoid capture, according to Tacitus, 8, or died of illness, according to Cassius Dio, 9. Meron Karimi Nasseri is an Iranian refugee who lived in the departure lounge of Terminal 1 in Acheral's de Gaulle airport from 26 August 1988 until July 2006, when he was hospitalized for an unspecified ailment. Basically, a dude spent about 18 years at an airport. His story was an inspiration to create a film, called The Terminal. You can read about his story on Wikipedia. This is a beautiful film really worth watching. I watched it twice already, if you don't believe me, then maybe this will convince you, it's a Steven Spielberg film, comma sorry for my spelling. This one depends where you live, he's well known in Japan, but not so much outside it. Sato Musashibo Benkei, normally just called Benkei, was awesome. He's the subject of much Japanese folklore, and it's sometimes hard to tell what really happened and what is a story. He was a fighter of great skill and loyalty. He spent time as a ascetic monk and a warrior. One of his life goals was to take 1000 sword from 1000 samurai. He'd wander Kyoto at night looking for samurai. He carried 7 different weapons on his back. I feel like this part may be folklore, and was a master of them all. Near the end of his life, he was an outlaw. He died in battle. Malaying with Benkari was sure death. So archers peppered him with arrows. After the battle ended. They found his body covered in dozens of arrows. But he had not fallen when he died. He stood there, as if ready to fight. Really, just his death is enough to qualify him as awesome.